you guys. We're always grateful when our friends from Liberty come to help lead in worship. Uh, God is good. Uh, as you can look around, you'll see that there are a few folks that are missing, but you know God's here, and we're here, and that makes a majority. So uh, for those of you who are joining us online, we're grateful for your presence. Uh, if you've never filled out a connection card, we'd love for you to do it either electronically or if you're in the building, you can do one of the uh, physical cards. Uh, but I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we begin our time of corporate singing work and worship. And we will not be overcome I can walk down this dark and painful road I can face every fear of the unknown I can hear all God's children singing out We will not be overtaken We will not be overcome
touch the one But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough Then you came along
Well, good morning. It is good to see you all here, bright and shining faces. For those of you that I have not had the opportunity to meet, I look forward to meeting you. My name is Don Cox. I'm serving as your interim pastor and look forward to how God is going to work to work through our congregation as the Lord is always at work. And I hope that the Lord is at work in your life. And I hope that you will indeed see God at work through our time together today. If you turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, today I want to talk to you about the great exchange. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to serve you and to work alongside you. You all are a part of a group of churches called the SBC of Virginia, and we try to encourage pastors and church leaders through our weekly contact, even, in fact, even this very morning, I had contact with several pastors throughout the area. I get the opportunity to live here in uh, the most beautiful part of the state. Of course, I'm, I might be a little biased, but uh, nah, not really. And we always are trying to encourage pastors and church leaders. We're also trying to edify our churches by encouraging us to do things like pray for our missionaries. In fact, you probably saw in this uh, week's Friday update, you saw a resource that we produced called 52 Sundays that encourages us to pray for our missionaries. We ought to be praying for our close to 4,000 missionaries that serve outside the borders of the United States of America. And we're always looking for opportunities to encourage our people to do that. Because we realize the difference that our mission work is doing, and we ought to celebrate that and rejoice in that. And the reason why we do that is because we have a good news to share. You do know that, don't you? We have good news to share. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 really points that out to us. You look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you will see that it really the context of it begins in verse 17 and goes down to verse 21. And I rejoice to tell you that there is good news here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it, say oh me. <laughs> All right, you with me? Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That's one reason that we pray for our missionaries, because they're taking a message of reconciliation to the world. Look at verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you, implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we've opened our Bibles. Lord, we now pray that you would open our hearts that we might see the truth that you have for us. We might see the gospel that is good news, hope for the world. And we might even see how that can take place in an individual's life. The hope that is in you, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I don't know if this Christmas you got any good deals. Did you get any good deals at Christmas time? You know, you, you, I see some heads nodding. You know, the kind of good deal where when you walk out of the store, you almost want to run because you don't want the manager to change their mind, right? Those kind of good deals. The kind of deals where you kind of take a double take, like, really? Two for the price of one? Makes you wonder what they were priced at in the first place. But anyway, I'm just saying, there's sometimes when there are some good Deals. Well, I'm here to tell you 
the deal that God offers to us is the greatest deal that has ever been shared in human history. It is actually amazing to think that God would reconcile us to himself and change us forever. In fact, the truth of this passage makes all the difference in the world. It can take someone who's very frustrated and transform them. It can take someone who is struggling and depressed and can transform them. The abundant life that Jesus offers is neither dependent upon our good deeds, nor is it received passively. It is what this passage points out and others have said is the great exchange. If you'll notice in verse 21, the truth of this is that for our sake, God the Father made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For he made him to be sin for us. Imagine that. That that means that God the Father regarded as sinful Jesus who was never sinful, who had never committed a sin. It means that Jesus took upon himself our sins. He took upon himself our shame, our sorrow, our difficulty, our deeds done that we should not have done and the deeds that we should have done that we did not. He took them all upon himself. This is a great reference in the Old Testament to Isaiah chapter 53. And in Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus came along, we see that there is a predicted Messiah that would come. Isaiah 53 says about him, Who has believed what the Lord, what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we look upon him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as from, uh, from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. This is the story of Jesus. Jesus has taken upon himself the guilt that we all have, the things that stand between us and our God. Just imagine for a moment that that you were to have all of the deeds of your life written down in a book. By the way, there is such a book. And just imagine all those things you should have done that you did not do, and they're written down also. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to work my way up to God. I'm going to do some deeds to undo those bad ones, and I'm going to somehow reconcile myself to God from those things that I did not do that I should have. But yet always before us, as we get closer and closer to God, there there is almost a, a record book that stands in the way. But it says here in Isaiah 53, what Jesus does is he takes our record of sin upon himself so that we might have that barrier removed from us. That's what Jesus does on our behalf. Again, I said it last week. He became our substitute, is what we call the substitutionary atonement. Jesus in my place, that is the gospel message. And it is good news. It is the best news that you can ever be told that Jesus took your place. That is the hope of the gospel. You know, sometimes when you read an inspiring novel, you'll hear a story, maybe a story about a citizens or a group of people or maybe an army, maybe a people that rise up and they give all that they have in honor of their king. Perhaps some of you read the books, The Hunger Games, or maybe you saw the movie. You'll remember the story of Primrose, who 
was chosen and was a substitute. You, you remember all that, don't you? But yet in the gospel, we don't have a people sacrificing for a king. We have a king sacrificing himself for the people. Now that's a grand old story. That's the story of the gospel. That's exactly what verse 21 tells us here. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. That's why the gospel is good news, not just good advice. Sometimes people come to the Bible and they think, well, the Bible is filled with good advice. There, there is definitely some guidance that God has for us, but that's not the primary point of the Bible. The primary point of the Bible is to point us to the good news because when we have the good news, then we can accept the good advice. You see, all religions in the world are based on following some kind of leader who has advice for us. The Christian gospel is very different because in the gospel... We're given advice, yes, but that's not the primary message. The primary message is that the king died for us. That's what it says right here in verse 21. It's not our performance that makes the difference. It's Jesus that makes the difference. He made him to be sin who knew no sin. It's interesting the word that's used here. When it speaks of Jesus that he knew no sin. The word that's used there means to be known by experience. Jesus never sinned. In fact, when they brought him to trial, they couldn't convict him without people making up things that weren't true. Jesus got what we deserved because of our sin, our lawlessness, the scripture says, is one way that sin is defined, which means a total disregard For what God has to say to us. The scripture sometimes calls sin defiance. Which means outright rebellion against authority. The scripture tells us that sin is like sometimes described as transgression. Which is rebellion against authority. So much so so that you're expressing yourself as an authority. Today when we think about sin we think about. Well you know murder is a sin and. Thievery is a sin, and lying is a sin, but also pride is a sin, and so few admit to it. Selfishness is a sin. Gossip is a sin. Oh, no, now he's meddling now. I'm just getting started. (laughs) Jealousy is a sin. All these are sins, and all those, the Scripture says, were laid upon Jesus. And the gospel is not just good advice, it is good news. Tim Keller wrote it this way, the gospel is this, you are more sinful and flawed in, our, in yourself than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Just imagine for a moment that uh, my, friend, my friend Donna is here, and just imagine that... Uh, Donna and her husband, they, you know, times were hard, and they decided they, they needed a new rug for their house, and so they went out to the discount store and maybe got a rug for about $300 or something. Really nice rugs, by the way, are much more than that. Just imagine they invited my wife and I over to dinner, and we're sitting there in their living room, and they have that discount rug that's there in the front room, and I'm, and I'm messing around with a pen in my pocket. And while I'm messing around with this pen in my pocket, it breaks open and the ink spills on that rug. Now, Donna's a very gracious person. She'd she'd forgive me, I'm sure. She might be a little bit upset, but she realized she got that at a discount anyway. She got a good deal. So it doesn't bother her that much. She goes out and probably tries to clean it, and if it doesn't clean, she'll throw it away and get her another discount rug. But just imagine for a moment... That I came over to Donna's house and she didn't have a discount rug in her house. She had one of those fine Persian rugs that are worth thousands of dollars. It's sitting there prominently in the front room and I take that pen and I'm messing around with it and ink spills out on that beautiful Persian rug. She'd probably be a little bit more upset about that than the discount rug, don't you think? Sometimes people... 
treat the Lord like he's on discount. And they think when they sin, it's not a big deal. But it is a big deal because we serve a big God. And we have to be very, very careful to understand what Jesus has done on our behalf. Look what it says. For our sin, God the Father made him, regarded him, treated him to be sin who knew no sin. You see, the bad news is we're all sinners. The good news is the gospel is only for sinners. If you're, if you're sitting here today and you've never committed a sin, you've never said something you shouldn't have or done something you shouldn't have done, well, this is not for you. You can, you can tune out and not worry about what I'm having to say. But for the rest of us, including the guy talking, I'm here to tell you that we're all sinners, but the good news is the gospel is only for sinners. It's only for us who are sinners. And how we get restored is we repent of our sin. And the scripture says here, made him to be sin who knew no sin. So the gospel, first of all, is the fact that we can be forgiven of our guilt. It's a guilt that we all share. But yet in the gospel, we don't just get forgiveness, we get transformation. If you keep on reading, you'll notice that it says that there is a grace that we are offered. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in him. It, it means that God offers to us his grace. His grace is offered to us. You see, in the gospel, we aren't just forgiven so that our slate is wiped clean because God knows when our slate is wiped clean, what do we do? We mess it up once more and we need a slate cleaned again. That's the way we operate. But yet God offers to us grace. You see there on your outline, G-R-A-C-E. If you want to describe the gospel, it's the gospel of grace. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. He paid for it. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what God offers to us. And there's a beautiful picture of how this takes place. You know, we, we just talked about the, the guilt that we all share. What happens in the gospel is that our sin is imputed to Jesus. He is regarded as to have done it himself. He is treated as sinful. Here's the beauty of the gospel. Just as our sin is imputed to him, his righteousness is imputed to us. It's a beautiful picture of what God does in us. To impute means to put on the record of, to put on the account of. It means that in the gospel, when Christ obeyed, it is as if we obeyed. When, God the Father, when Christ pleased the Father, it is as if we please the Father. Some of you need to hear today, maybe for the first time in your life, that if you are in Christ, it means God the Father is pleased with you. And it makes all the difference in the world. See, the gospel is not just that we get forgiven. The gospel is also that Christ's righteousness is imputed, given to us, so that when God the Father looks upon us, He looks upon us, through the lens of Christ's righteousness on our behalf. Just imagine for a moment that you're uh, working in your house this springtime. Perhaps you're gardening or working in the yard in some way. And you just get miserably filthy. Just imagine that uh, at the end of the day you're starving and you decide that you need something to eat. And so you come in the house and you find that your spouse had made, has made a wonderful meal. You can smell it. Oh, it's, it's just beautiful. It's always dangerous to talk about food during a sermon. But you understand what I'm saying, right? You've been working in the yard all day. You're, you're grimy, sweaty, you're dirty all over. And you're so hungry that you're in a hurry. And so you decide... That instead of getting a shower, you're in a hurry. You decide you're just going to put on some clean clothes on that dirty body of yours. And you sit down to eat a wonderful meal that your spouse has made. 
By the way, if you try that, you're probably going to go hungry. Or just imagine that you're working in the yard all day, you're sweaty, you're grimy, and you come in and you smell the food and you want to take part in it. So therefore, you take off those grimy clothes, you take a very quick shower and wash off. But in your hurry, you don't put on clean clothes, you put on your old dirty clothes and sit down at the table to eat. By the way, you probably are going to go hungry again. Didn't know you were going to get free marital advice today, did you? <laughs> First one's free. After this, I charge you. But anyway, you'd never do either, either one of those, would you? The gospel is this. We are dirty and grimy in our sin. And God doesn't just take our old dirty clothes off of us. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And he gives us a new set of clothes Right here it says the clothes of righteousness. That's what it says right here. That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. One pastor put it this way. God's salvation does not come in response to a changed life. A changed life comes in response to the salvation offered as a free gift. There's a guilt that we all have. There is a grace that we're all offered. But also there is a gratitude that is due, notice the beginning of this verse, for our sake he did all this, for our sake. It was because God so loved the world that he sent his son. It was a, the appeal of a loving father to a wandering and a strange child who, that they would merely come home. And it is that kind of gratitude that is due. Pastor Paul Tripp put it this way, your thankfulness is directly related to your admission of how grave your plight is as a sinner. Self-righteousness crushes gratitude. You see, Jesus says, follow me. That's what it means to be a Christian. And if you're not following Jesus, you are not a Christian. It says here that gratitude is is what is due. For our sake he did all this. Isaac Watts says, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his Head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. There is a guilt that we all share. There is a grace that we're all offered, but also there is a gratitude that is due. Tim Keller put it this way in one of his books. The Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me, yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. Think about that. I'm so flawed and sinful that Jesus had to die for me, but yet I am so loved that Jesus gladly did so. Based upon that, that's why we follow Jesus. It's out of a life of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude. And in one sense, it reminds us of how vitally important it is to understand that if we're struggling, the gospel offers to us hope. It keeps us from discouragement because we're forgiven and we need not despair. It keeps us from self-righteousness because the gospel is only for sinners and our performance is never enough. And thirdly, it motivates us by gratefulness. See, that's that's my story. 
a story of God's transformation and joy. See, I don't come from a long line of Baptist preachers or even a long line of people who follow the Lord. No. God came looking for me. I grew up in a little town called Alta Vista. Some of you might have heard of Alta Vista over near Lynchburg. And as I grew up there, I grew up in a single-parent home. My father was not involved in my life. In fact, died just prior to my, prior to my birth. Wasn't involved in my life. And as I grew older as a young child, I got in lots and lots of trouble, especially as I entered the late years of elementary school headed toward middle school. It was in those days that my mother, a single mom who wasn't active in church, she was looking for help and hope, and she'd been invited to the local Baptist church in the middle of town, Central Baptist Church, and it was central in town, right across from the town hall. And it was there that we visited in June of 1980 when I was 12. And that pastor did something that made a difference in my life that changed it forever. You see, the very next week following our visit to the church, he came to visit us. And he came into our living room, and my mom called it the sitting room. It was the important room. Had plastic on the sofa, you know. <laughs> it was an important day when we took the plastic off the sofa. We sat in the living room, and that pastor, his name was Morris Cather. He had been a chaplain at Hargrave Military Academy for a number of years, and he knew, tr he knew all about troubled boys, and I was one of them. And he sat in that living room and he explained to me what Jesus had done. He explained to me the hope of the gospel. And I didn't completely know all that it would mean, but I knew that it was a deal that I could not pass up. This great exchange that I've been talking about to you this morning. And it was there in our living room that I bowed my knees and gave my life to Jesus, and my mom and I got involved in the local Baptist church. I was baptized the very next Sunday evening. My life has never been the same since. It hasn't, it hasn't been perfect, but I do know this. God has transformed my attitudes, desires, the words that come out of my mouth. This pastor poured his life into mine. So much so that later on when I went to James Madison up in Harrisonburg, when I went there, the second summer of my time there in college, I volunteered as a local youth leader at a church that didn't have a youth program. And it was in that summer that I had the opportunity to try to teach some of the Bible stories that I've been learning through the years, to be able to mentor young people who were just a few years younger than me, I am very grateful for the patience of that church. I, I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> but God did a great work in that church. And some of those youth are still friends of mine even to this day. And I'm grateful to tell you that some of them still walk with Jesus. But it wasn't because of my efforts. It's because of what Jesus had done. So much so when that summer was over, I went back to JMU. I was studying accounting. My goal was to have a big house on the biggest hill in town, making the most money with a white picket fence and two and a half kids to not be poor any longer. I'd grown up poor. I didn't want to be poor any longer. And so I had a goal of making money. I went back that fall and I just couldn't pursue that anymore. I wasn't happy. I wasn't at peace. And so I went back home and talked to my pastor about it. And he said, I, I think God might be working in your life to do something different. And so it was at the end of that 
summer, that fall, that I came and prayed with my pastor and shared with my local church that I thought that God might want me to go into ministry, to give my life to the Lord Jesus. So that's exactly what I did. And then when I graduated from college, I had uh, started dating a girl that was chasing me around campus. <laughs> She's not in the first service, so I can probably get away with that. <laughs> As I graduated from college, she was still at James Madison, and so I went to live in Atlanta, Georgia, near Georgia Tech, in a public housing project called Techwood Homes, not far from the, the uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium that's there in Atlanta. And it was there that God really put a heart for missions within me, and a desire to live at that call to follow the Lord in that way, and I've basically been doing that ever since. When uh, my wife graduated from college, my uh, father-in-law offered me $500 and a ladder to take her, but I, I didn't take him up on that offer. I probably should have. Imagine if I'd invested that $500 way back then. We got married and went away to seminary the first time in Memphis, Tennessee. I served on staff and was involved in uh, getting some of my education. Eventually went to Texas, got some more education because the first school didn't take, so I kept, <laughs> kept on going to school. And then while I was in Texas, I started pastoring a church. And eventually God called me to return to Virginia in 1997 after I had completed my education and it was in that situation that God began to put in my heart not just a burden for missions and not just a passion for proclaiming the truth of God, but also to minister to, to other pastors and to other churches. It was about that time that the group that we're all a part of, the SBC of Virginia, was trying to come up with a strategy of how to help their churches because the convention was growing greatly. And they came up with a, with a strategy where they would deploy missionaries that would live out among the churches, live locally nearby, so they were within a close distance to help the local church. And that, that's exactly what I did. After pastoring for about 12 years in 2004, I uh, began serving in a role similar to what I'm doing today, where I, in, in one sense, I'm ministering to pastors to encourage them, to equip them, to help them, to mentor them along the way. On the other hand, I'm also get the opportunity to help churches in all kinds of different ways. For example, uh, training and conflict resolution and trying to help churches follow the call of God upon their lives. In fact, sometimes what I get a chance to do is I get to help churches when they're in a time of transition. In fact, I've done it dozens of times. In fact, after the second service today, I've got to sprint off to another location just like I've been helping your pastor search team, I'm helping another pastor search team in another community nearby. I tell you that whole story to tell you this. Jesus said to all of us, follow me, and that's what I've been endeavoring to do ever since, to follow him. Now, just because God called me into ministry doesn't mean that everybody who follows Jesus goes into ministry. God can use you in whatever vocation, whatever role that you're living out in life. He can use you in your neighborhood. He can use you in your family. He can use you in your school. It is in the gospel that we have hope. It is in the gospel that God changes us and makes a difference in our life. So much so that the transformation can be remarkable if we will merely follow Jesus. He can change us. I'm here to tell you, by way of personal testimony, that God can indeed change a life. Because in the gospel, we have hope. In fact, there have been many times when I'll go back to my hometown, and people who may not know will discover that I'm now a preacher of the gospel and have been for more than 30 years. It's pretty shocking, and I certainly enjoy shocking them. You see, the gospel is this. God takes you wherever you are, but the beauty of it is he doesn't leave you there. 
In the gospel, Jesus takes our guilt upon himself and he gives to us his righteousness and transforms us. And in the gospel, that gospel makes such a difference in us that we should live a life of gratitude. You see, I, I, I firmly believe that you either have a testimony to share or you need one. You either have a story of God's transformation or you need a transformation. I'm not sure which you are. I'm not here because I have lived a perfect life. I'm here because of God's transforming grace. That God can come into the life of a person who will attempt to follow Jesus and make a difference in their lives. About six years ago, a man named Andre Crouch passed away. He wrote words, I think, that sum up perfectly what this passage says to me and what my life has attempted to be, and I pray that yours is as well. He wrote this. How can I say thanks for the things that you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, yea, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Is that true in your life? Is it true in your life that God has taken up residence and transformed you? You see, in the gospel, we recognize that there is a repentance that must take place, that we must recognize that we indeed need help and hope in the gospel. There is a point where we must recognize that we need God to make a difference in our life. It requires that we come to God humbly, but it's also in the gospel that we realize that it's not just advice like that that we need to take. It is in the gospel that we're given and exchange our sin for the righteousness of Jesus. Our sin, not just to receive the forgiveness of God, but the transformation that comes because Jesus' righteousness is placed on us. And when we do that, it changes everything. It changes not just our destiny, it changes our focus and our perspective. It gives us a, a life of gratitude. It gives us an opportunity to express that gratitude by serving God, not so that he might be pleased with us, but because we love him, because he is our father whom we love and want to serve because he has made such a difference in our lives. This verse here, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Is that what is, that what is happening in your life? Is that what is happening in your story? Do you have a testimony to share or do you need one? Do you have a story where you can truly say this is what Jesus has done and the difference that's been made? Because we can all rally around the fact that we're all sinners in need of that grace. Will you pray with me? Lord, we are reminded today of the beautiful picture of your love for us. The picture that we see in Jesus coming on our behalf. And we're reminded of the fact that, Lord, you love us so much that you would see our need and make provision for it. 
we realize that we're sinners in need of salvation. But on the other hand, we see in the gospel that Jesus gladly gave himself on our behalf. He is in our place. And Lord, I pray as we conclude this time of worship, I'm reminded, Lord, of your great desire for everyone to be reconciled to you. Maybe even right now, Lord, you're at work in someone's life and heart in this room right now, someone that's watching. Lord, I pray that you'd give them your grace and mercy that they might be forgiven and transformed through the power of the gospel. I pray that you give them the assurance of their salvation, that you care for them so much that Jesus came and Jesus is available to them and that grace is available to them that they would merely accept it if they would repent and believe. Lord, give faith, we pray, even this very moment, maybe even to someone in this room right now, Lord. We're grateful for the gospel of Jesus, the fact that Jesus died, that we might have life, and in Jesus we have hope because of his righteousness in us. Lord, thank you for these, my brothers and sisters. Thank you for the opportunity to give praise and glory to you because of what you've done in my life, but what you want to do in the lives of many in this room. Lord, help us to take that message of reconciliation to the world, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. We sing.
Dale McNutt, and along with Dewey Smith, uh, he and I are the co-prayer coordinators for the Pastor Church Search Committee, and we have a couple of announcements this morning for you. First, if you have not read the, uh, the Friday update that uh, we are beginning this Monday evening at 7 o'clock, asking the church to pray, uh, to pray for our pastor search efforts, to uh, pray individually, but uh, to pray for both the search process and for us to uh, seek and find God's will and his answer for us on our next pastor. The second announcement is that we are going to begin a series of in-person prayer meetings. Uh, we're working out the final uh, pieces to that and I look forward to possibly having an announcement to that effect in the next Friday update, so please be reading those. Also, uh, I'd like to share with you that uh, as we pray together in person and apart, it's important that we pray together, and it's important that we pray for God's will. Um, when one of the disciples asked Jesus to show him how to pray, he gave us a, a model uh, by offering the Lord's Prayer, which is actually a servant's prayer to us. And in that there are several components, and I'd like you to think about those as you begin to pray independently and then also as we enter into our prayer corporately. First, that we would need to praise God. God is almighty. He created the heavens and the earth. He's capable of doing anything, but he has a will for us. He has a will for us individually, and he has a will for this church. So we pray that we praise him and acknowledge him for who he is, and then we pray, we pray for him to, uh, to give us his will. We pray for him to forgive us for our uh, sins, our indiscretions. And we pray for him to give us an answer to our, our pastor search. And we want to pray for that specifically. We want to pray that uh, without general terms. We want to be very specific because as we uh, pray together and if we pray the same prayer, it creates a symphony of prayer that God cannot help but hear. So we hope that, uh, that you'll join us in that uh, and look forward to having the first of many different uh, uh, types of corporate prayer. Uh, the first uh, will be announced next week, but this will be a continuing thing that we'll do uh, throughout the process until we have uh, found and uh, have our new pastor on board. So I'll offer a closing prayer, and then we'll be excused to Sunday school. Father God, we are so grateful that you are our God, that you have provided us with this church, a place to worship. Lord, we're grateful that you have designed a will for us. We pray that we can seek you. We pray that uh, we can find joy, that you provide, only you provide to us, that we have hope through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that we be faithful. As we go out this week, we pray to be great servants, that we uh, are witnesses to the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ. And we pray all these things through his name. Amen. <laughs>